have a confession. I love Legos. Okay, I'm 49 years old and I love Legos. Um, one of the things I really like are the architecture sets. So whenever I go to a new city or a new landmark, I'll get the architecture set of that place to kind of mark that moment. And so I have, you know, New York City, Statue of Liberty, San Francisco, Trevi Fountain, uh, Brandenburg Gate in Berlin. And about a month ago, I went to London for the first time. Guys, I've been through, like, I've been to Ireland, Northern Ireland, Scotland. I've been through Heathrow countless times, but never actually put my feet on the soil of London. So I was so excited. It actually became this whirlwind trip. It was awesome. Pastor Nina, Pastor Joel, Pastor Ryan, several of us went to a conference in a church that's doing some things that are very similar to what we're feeling called to do with Dream Collective. And so super excited to be there, to breathe their air, to bump into their anointing. But it was a whirlwind. So we got on a flight Wednesday night, landed Thursday morning, went straight to the church, and then got back to the hotel about 10 p.m. Next morning, got up while it was still dark outside, went to the church for the conference, got back to the hotel after 10 p.m. Same thing the next day, then got on a flight back to the United States. And it was crazy. And so a couple of days ago, I thought to myself, it's time for me to go get my London Lego set. But I second guessed it because, did I really see London? <laughs> I mean, literally all I saw was the church, which by the, I mean, was magnificent, like worth the trip alone to see this historic, wonderful church. But all I saw was the conference space and the hotel. I, I might, I, I, I caught a glimpse of Trafalgar Square as we were in the taxi on the way back to the airport. But as I went to get my Lego set, I thought, does it count? Like, I was, I was geographically in London, but I didn't experience it. I, I didn't get to be a part of the history and the culture and the beauty and the art. Like, to not be able to sit at the Eagle and Child pub and soak in the magic of Tolkien and Lewis and the stories that were written there that enchanted a generation. To not experience the transcendence and the awe and the wonder and the pageantry of Westminster Chapel. Like, I didn't even get, like, the obligatory photograph with the stoic guard or the phone booth or the double-decker bus. <laughs> Can I really get a Lego set with iconic places that I never laid eyes on? And then I thought, you know, how often is that a metaphor for life? Like, we're geographically present, but somehow oblivious to the significance that's happening all around us. How often do we physically inhabit a space, but don't engage or experience the wonder that is really there? Like, how often are we just going through life, but we're not really living? We, we find ourselves in a space, but we're not seeing anything that makes it more than just a dot on a map. And the world is dark and we feel disconnected and we're disenchanted. Welcome to National Community Church. Welcome to those of you at our Nova campus. Welcome to those of you that are listening online. If you will join me in Isaiah 9 in, uh, in the 8th century BC, we're going to join another people that lived in a place where the world was dark and they felt disconnected and they were disenchanted. The people of God had lost their way. They had lost their sense of identity, their purpose, and into that darkness, darkness, into that disconnectedness. They're crying out for God to do something new. But they experience threats from the north and from the south and the Assyrian empire is at their doorstep. And the prophet Isaiah walks into that place and declares in Isaiah 9 verse 2, the people walking in darkness have seen a great light. In that dark and disconnected and disenchanted world, Isaiah declares the coming of one who will spread light. 
Jesus didn't come because everything was well lit and wonderful. He came precisely because it was dark. He came precisely because the world was disconnected and disenchanted and cold. It's like the moment when we open the first pages of The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe and we enter into a Narnia where it is always winter and never Christmas until Aslan enters and the great reversal of all things begin. That's how Jesus came into the world, to begin the great reversal of all of human history. The gift of Christmas, the gift of this season, is it gives us an opportunity to step in to that place of wonder. There's something about this season that shocks our system and makes our senses go on full alert so that we can fully experience and fully engage. It is wonder that ignites within us hope and joy and love and peace. It reawakens us and reorients us to who we are and whose we are and why we're here and what God has called us to do in this place. Wonder is what beckons us to see the goodness and the beauty and the truth of God in the world around us. And as followers of Jesus, we are invited to be both recipients of that wonder and agents of that wonder to the world around us. Isaiah goes on a few times verses later in verse 6 and tells us exactly what this child is going to be, what this light is going to be like. And he says, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. The miracle of Christmas is that no matter how dark the world becomes, the light shines in. And light illuminates the way ahead as the wonderful counselor. The light brings the healing and the restoration and the reconnection of the prince of peace. The light brings the warmth of the heavenly father, the everlasting father. And light also brings power and might and strength of the mighty God. That, that word mighty God in, in Hebrew, the name is El Gibor. It's the same word that's used to describe David's mighty men. It means hero or champion. That God is sending the light to be the hero of the story. And it's this theme, it's this mighty God theme that Luke, the gospel writer of Luke and Acts, he picks up on this theme in Isaiah and it becomes a thread that weaves through his entire gospel account. And he begins his gospel account by confronting and challenging our expectations, our presuppositions about what a mighty God will look like, what strength and power illuminating in light to the earth is really going to look like. And he does it by introducing us in the very beginning to three kings and three kingdoms. So in Luke chapter 1, he introduces us to King Herod. Now, Herod is a very, very complex character. Herod was uh, culturally Greek. He was raised according to Greek culture. Politically, he was Roman. Ethnically, he was Arab. His father was Idumean, or the descendants of Esau. His mother was Nabataean. And he's sitting on the Jewish throne. This is just one anecdote of how messy and complicated and complex things can be in the Middle East. Now, we've got to go a little bit to history to understand Herod's hubris and political skills. So Herod was a strong supporter and ally of Mark Antony. Until Mark Antony was defeated by Octavian at Actium. And then Octavian is crowned Caesar Augustus, the first emperor of Rome, and he begins to systematically execute all of Antony's supporters. So when he summons Herod to meet him at Rhodes, Herod uses this ingenious mix of hubris, false humility, groveling, and chutzpah. 
He marches into the presence of Caesar Augustus in his royal robes and has the audacity to declare to Caesar that the reason Antony had been so successful and so powerful for so long was because Herod was such an ardent and loyal supporter and such a good client king, and he was willing to graciously offer that same thing to Caesar Augustus. And Caesar bought it and installed Herod back on his throne in Jerusalem. But Herod's hubris is put on full display in his building projects. In the desert, he built, where there's like an inch and a half of rainfall every year, Herod built the palace fortress of Masada. Uh, An inch and a half of rainfall, and there were three bathhouses, a swimming pool, watered gardens, and cisterns for the residents to drink from. On a sandy beach where there is no deep water harbor, he builds the largest harbor in the ancient world at Caesarea. And in Jerusalem on the Temple Mount, he constructs, reconstructs the Jewish temple, the largest enclosed structure in the Roman world. But he's also paranoid. And he has no trouble whatsoever eliminating anything and anyone who seems to stand in his way, including a beloved wife, his sons, and baby boys in Bethlehem. In Luke chapter 2, we're introduced to Caesar Augustus. Caesar uh, is the first emperor of the newly established Roman Empire. He's, He's said to have declared on his deathbed, I came, uh, I I found Rome built of clay. I leave it to you in marble. Look at this inscription that was found to describe Caesar Augustus. It reads this way. Since providence, which has ordered all things and is deeply interested in our life, has set in most perfect order by giving us Augustus, whom she filled with virtue, that he might benefit humankind. Sending him as a savior, both for us and for our descendants, that he might end war and arrange all things. The birthday of the god Augustus was the beginning of the good news for the world that came by reason of him. Now, if we just took the name Augustus out of this, we would swear this was some ancient description of the coming of Jesus. In a world where a man builds massive structures to declare his power and might, where inscriptions are written to declare that a man is the son of God. Against the backdrop of that world, Luke introduces us to a third king, Jesus, and the kingdom of God. Against a backdrop of engineering marvels, we find this king in a stone feeding trough in Bethlehem. Against the backdrop of a world where people herald the arrival of the savior of all mankind, the son of God has come. Angels show up to a group of poor shepherds in a forgotten place, in a forgotten land, to say, peace on earth, goodwill to men. You'll find this day a baby, Christ the Lord. God's answer to the trauma and the trouble and the tragedy of the darkness of the world was a baby in a manger in Bethlehem. God's answers to the bullies of the world was not a bigger bully, but a baby in a manger. In Bethlehem, Jesus comes to establish his kingdom. He is the mighty God. He's the hero of the story, but this hero didn't drop from the heavens with a cape around his shoulders, with superpowers ready to all people around him. He came in humility and weakness and in the normal, messy, gritty places that we know as life. The mighty God. And Luke continues on this theme by, by oh, let me, let me say, I, this, is, this is so good. Sorry. I, I've got to share this. First Corinthians 
verse 125. This is the voice translation. It says, you can count on this. God's foolishness will always be wiser than mere human wisdom, and God's weakness will always be stronger than mere human strength. Some of us just need to write that on a note card and put it somewhere where we see it. That's God's answer to the darkness, disconnectedness, the disenchantment of the world. And then Luke continues unveiling this mighty God in a series of declarations that we see throughout his gospel. And it begins to explode off the pages in chapter one as Mary declares what God has done in her and for her and through her. This is so fascinating. The first time that Mary publicly declares to the world what, what's going on in her life, what God's doing in her, through her, for her, she says these words in the Magnificat in Luke 1, verse 49. For the mighty God has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. He has performed mighty deeds with his arm. Mary begins by talking about, this is what the mighty God is doing in me and for me. And then she expands it from the personal to the chronological to say, he's doing this from generation to generation. And then she expands it again so that corporately and spatially and for all eternity, he is doing mighty things with his arm. He is uplifting the lowly. He is lifting up the humble. He's filling the hungry with good things. He is showing his mercy and his faith faithfulness through the descendants of Abraham through all generations. She declares the mighty God and his work in her personally, the work he is doing around her, the work he is doing in the world, the work he is doing in history. She ponders the mighty God that is growing within her. And then we skip over a few chapters later in Luke chapter four, and, and this is where Jesus makes his first public statement about who he is and what he's come to do. And in Luke four, verse 18, he says this, the spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. The first time Jesus shows up to publicly clarify, this is who I am and this is what I have come to do. Now, what is curiously missing from this statement? He, he doesn't say anything about the cross. He doesn't say anything about resurrection. He doesn't say anything about Fixing personal sin. As important as those things are. He's not talking about an escape hatch from this world to another. What he declares in this moment is on the power of God breaking into the world here and now to restore all things, to reconcile all things, to redeem all things, to reverse everything back to the goodness that it was intended to be. He focuses on the mighty God doing mighty things. And then we skip ahead a few more chapters. And there's a moment where the followers of John the Baptist come to Jesus and they say, John has sent us to you because he wants to know, are you really the one that we're waiting for? Are you really the Messiah or should we look for another? And, 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 and it's interesting here because if I were Jesus in this moment, I would have probably responded this way. Really? John, man. You, okay, you don't remember this because you were still a baby in your mom's womb, but you've heard the story. That when we came in, when our moms came into contact for the first time, you leapt for joy in your mother's womb. You were the first person to recognize who I was. John, don't, don't you remember the stories that we were telling about the birthday? Like, 
There were angels showing up to my mom, to my dad, to your dad. There were angels showing up to shepherds. These foreign kings from Persia came all the way to celebrate at my baby shower. John, don't you remember the miraculous events surrounding my birth? Okay, well, wait, wait, wait. If that's not enough, do you remember the miraculous events surrounding my baptism? You were there too. Like the, the dove like comes down and rests on my shoulder and a voice booms from heaven. This is my son in whom I'm well pleased. John, do you not remember like all the Old Testament prophecies that my birth alone has already fulfilled? But instead of like pointing to the signs of his miraculous birth or the miracles surrounding his baptism, Jesus responds with this. Luke 7, 22, go back and report to John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive sight. The lame walk. Those who have leprosy are cleansed. The deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is proclaimed to the poor. Jesus, instead of saying, look how awesome I am. Like, look at the miracles surrounding my birth. Look at the inscriptions that one day they'll write about me and connect them to these ancient prophecies. He says, look around you at the way the world is different. The very practical, everyday things I have done, the power of God is breaking into the real world. This is not some ethereal, transcendent thing that can't be felt or touched except by a few holy people. This is real stuff in the real world to bring reconciliation and restoration and healing. The mighty God is invading the reality of the world that we live in. John, look around and see the evidence that's all around you every single day. The works of the mighty God. I think what might be most helpful, maybe even most relevant though, is as I read this passage, is the reality that John doubted. I mean, John, who had 30 years of relationship, 30 years of being in ministry, 30 years of skin in the game, I, he was the front runner, he was the proclaimer. He was the herald that Jesus is here and the power of God is breaking into the world. He, he led with saying, repent, the kingdom of God is here. And yet in the midst of all of that, 30 years in, he thinks, I might have gotten it wrong. I'm not, I'm not sure anymore. I, I need a little reassurance that I've been on the right track. And I think he does that because of the circumstances he was in. He was in prison at the mercy of the king. I so strongly in prayer on Friday, I just, I had this strong sense that there is someone here today listening online. You're at Nova. And like John, you've been following Jesus for many, many years. You've had skin in the game. And for some reason in this season, maybe even because of this season, because the season right now, you're not experiencing the power and the goodness and the mercy and the love of God that you thought you knew to be true. You're wondering, have I got it right? Is this Jesus thing real? Is it worth it? And you are hanging on by a thread this weekend. And I want you to know, first of all, I was praying for you this weekend. But I also want you to know this. I want you to be encouraged in this. You are in good company. Because even John doubted. And John, even after he doubted, Jesus said, there's never been born anyone greater than John. Jesus loved John. He was crazy about John and Jesus loves you and is crazy about you. The second thing I want to invite you to consider to do now is just 
Consider the mighty works. Consider the mighty works that you've seen God do in your life. Like Mary, you might need to take a moment to just pause and ponder the things in your heart. Like John, you may need to hit the pause button and just remember, no, these are the things that I have seen. Maybe I'm not seeing the mighty God right now in the way that I want to see him, but I have seen him. Borrow faith from your past. Borrow faith from someone sitting around you and remember the mighty God is still at work in the world. Now, many of us are probably here this weekend and and we're not ready to throw it in. We're just not feeling it right now. Like, we're we're, we're in the season of Christmas. We're, We're geographically here. We're in Advent, but there's no anticipation. It's just dread. Um... We're, we're approaching Christmas. We're, we're physically in Christmas, but there's no joy or peace or hope. It's just tasks and timelines. It's like we're, we're present. Like I was present in London. You're present in the season, but the presence of the promise eludes you. It, 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 there are a lot of reasons that these things happen in our lives, and the longer we live, the more things stack up and build up that just can make the season harder. Um, for some of us, we, we've experienced a deep loss, and for some of you, that's very, very new. I lost someone very important to me in the, like the, the day after Christmas, and so this season, that, that shadow always kind of just hangs over it. Maybe you're grieving for that child who is who has walked away from their faith or maybe walked away from you or maybe you're grieving the lack of laughter filling your house because the child that you desire so much has not shown up. Maybe the marriage is falling apart, the relationships aren't aligning vocationally, you're not sure how things are gonna work out. It, it could just be that no place like home for the holidays is like just true. It's just like, yep, it's bad. Like, the, what Christmas does is it sets this really nice, pretty table for you to bring all the crazy right. around it, <laughs> right? Like, sometimes there's something about Christmas that just invites us into a place where there are the circumstances we can't navigate, the problems we can't solve, the people we can't please, and the expectations we can't meet. And we just need God to remind us he's able, right? He's able to do abundantly more than all we could ever ask or imagine in all of those places in our lives. I want to encourage us to do three things this week. Just this week, just an experiment for this week. One, look for evidence of the mighty God in the world around us. Just look for evidence of it. I love this. Every man's Talmud said that the, that the, the ancient rabbis would, would encourage people to do this. It says, the rabbis ordained that on beholding shooting stars, earthquakes, thunders, storms, and lightnings, the benediction to be uttered is this. Blessed art thou, O Lord our God, the king of the universe, whose strength and power fill the world. We can just begin by looking at nature around us. I I walked by a tree earlier this week and I saw one leaf and I thought to myself, the number of chemicals and the number of chemical processes that had to happen to turn this leaf from green to orange. God, you're awesome. When I look at the Big Dipper and I realize that the light from some of those stars left that star when my grand was born. And then you see even further into the universe and we're seeing light from stars that left there like millions of years ago. God, you are mighty. Look for evidence of the mighty God in the world around us. Write it down where we see God at work in powerful ways. Secondly, confess your need. Write down specifically where you need him to show up as the mighty God in your life. Write it down, circle it, and then make that your prayer list. God, I need you to show up in a mighty way to bring healing in my body. I need you to show up in a mighty way to bring reconciliation in that relationship. I need you to show up in a mighty way to reset and reorient me on the path that you've asked me to walk and just say, God, 
Do these things. Now, here's, here's my warning. I've found over years of following Jesus that often when I'm asking him to show up in a mighty way about a specific area, that's not the area that he shows up in. And guys, I don't know. I mean, that's a whole other sermon series to talk about maybe why that is. But I'm telling you, if you write it down and you say, God, show up in a mighty way, you will find him showing up in mighty and unexpected ways in your life. Third, declare the mighty God. Declare it. Say it out loud. Read scripture that declares the mighty God. If you don't know where to start, open up in Luke chapter 1 and read the Magnificat. Just read it out loud. Open up Isaiah 9 and read what the prophet Isaiah said. We can borrow the words of other people. I mean, sing the Christmas carols. We have a whole soundtrack for this season to declare how mighty God is. Now, not, not Santa baby or last Christmas. I'm talking Christmas carols. They declare the might and the power of the mighty God. Just look for evidence. Be honest about where you need it and then declare his mighty power. Colossians 1.17 says, he is before all things and in him all things hold together. I love that. This is a season where you think, I can't hold it together. We don't have to. He holds it together. We think, I'm about to fall apart. <laughs> I, don't, I don't have myself together. It's okay. He's got you. Amen. Amen. His mighty power is seen in the big miracles. They're seen in the big displays of creation, the big moments of healing and resurrection. And they're also found in those places where we just need to be held together. He is able. He is for you. He is with you. He sees you. He knows you. He loves you. He is for you. I believe like he felt about John. He's, he's crazy about you. Let him show up in mighty ways in this season. Reawaken the wonder in your life that in a dark place, in a disconnected place, in a disenchanted place, the light has come. And we have an opportunity to believe the unbelievable, to conceive the impossible, to trade fear of the unknown for faith in the unseen, that in the midst of chaos, we experience this peace because he is able to hold it together. As followers of Jesus, we are called, we're, we're gifted the opportunity to be recipients of his wonder. And then we're invited to be agents of his wonder to the world the mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace, the wonderful Counselor. He's here today. Would you just, would you just reach up your hands and say, I need you, I need your mighty power at work in my life. Jesus, we thank you that you came to shine the light in a dark and disconnected and disenchanted world. Oh, come, oh, come, Emmanuel. Comfort your people. Let the light shine in the darkness. Rise with healing in your wings today. May your light illuminate the way ahead as the wonderful counselor. May it bring us the warmth of your love as the everlasting Father, may it bring the healing and the reconciliation and the restoration as the Prince of Peace. And may we experience the power of your light in the mighty God. The hopes and fears of all the years are found in you, Jesus. Would you come? Help us to be recipients of wonder today and equip us to be agents of your wonder in the world. In Jesus' name, amen.